Good afternoon in Queensland, Western Australia and the Northern Territory. I'm Dante. I'll be taking you through today's one on getting found on Google. We're looking specifically on what you can do as a small business to help you get found on Google. This is a live one, so you can ask questions as you're going along. The Q&A window is open. I've got the webinar chat underway as well. So if you've got questions on the way that you would like to ask specifically about your business, or about how you may be able to apply these principles to it, um, please drop them in there. I know that um, the SEO world is uh, very big and very scary and quite often very scammy as well. So I'd like to be able to sort of clarify any of those things and hopefully get you on the road to doing great SEO pretty much all by yourself as far as you can until you may need help from others along the way. But, you know, hopefully we're not going to have to cover that much today. Um, this will be much more of an overview of the things you may need to address when it comes to getting found better um, through your SEO on Google. Let's get underway. My name is Dante, as I said, um, I've done a lot of work with Google's digital springboard program, which is a digital literacy program for small businesses and not for profits. I work with Facebook and the boost with Facebook um, uh, program, which goes around Australia and teaches small businesses how to better use Facebook and Instagram, WhatsApp and Messenger for business. And as part of the Australian Small Business Advisory Services Digital Solutions program as well, working alongside Treaty Business Consulting and the SEO and social agency that I formed about Really five years ago now, Clickstarter, which is based out of Darwin in the uh, NT, but also operates in all states and territories across Australia with a very, very cool team that I'm starting to work with as well. Um, just uh, bear in mind, if you want to watch this or you need to drop out halfway through or you want to just pick it up again, in a couple of days' time, this will be available on Business Station's YouTube channel at youtube.com. Then just type in Business Station and be able to see the channel there with all the C19 Biz Booster free webinars for you to be able to view again um, anytime you like. So yeah, if you do have to go, that might be a great option for you as well. So when it comes to experiences of online, 93% of online experiences actually start with a search engine. You would think that maybe, you know, we go into Chrome, you go straight to, um, to, to Facebook or you go straight to the websites you're doing. But when you're typing your query into Chrome, most of us are literally just typing the first thing and it queries Google and then brings back the search site or the site that you want to open up. So that's a lot of people. That means it's something you really can't ignore. Only 7% of experiences start through other areas, whether it's through social media or through others. Now, once you're in those things like social media and whatnot, you're of course very involved and very much, um, you know, enveloped by that particular platform. So I'm not saying that, you know, no experiences start elsewhere. It's just that the search engine is where a lot of these experiences start. And it's also where the majority of traffic comes to most websites these days. Not a lot of people are finding you because they saw you on a TV ad. Not a lot of people are finding you because they saw it on a sticker on the back of the ute. Usually they're finding you because they're looking for a product or a service or even for your particular brand. And they're typing that into Google to find you. So in that case, it's probably more than 93%. It's probably more like 95, 96% of people who are coming to you originally found you because they found you through a search engine of some degree. How it's then broken down is that 65% of the results that come through to websites are usually from organic search results. That's SEO. That's what we're talking about today. The people who will come to you through not paying for it, but they'll be able to get through to that as your, um, as your primary as your primary um, way of getting people through from search engines. Then another 15% coming through from the three pack, pack of maps. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just go and type in any kind of business plumbers in Perth and you'll be able to see that three pack of different um, options you've got for plumbers in Perth with a map on top of it. So the local map results produce another 15% and paid results are actually only producing around about 20% of the traffic that's going through to websites today. So that's actually really telling, even though they sit at the very top, we're not trusting them quite as much. We're trusting the organic results. We've almost trained ourselves the same way we trained ourselves on TV stations to flick the channel when the ads come on. And the same way when the ads come on the radio, we tend to flip the station as well to go between two major radio stations in town. Well, then we're doing the same with Google. We're going, yeah, I know there are ads at the top. Ignore them, go straight down to the real results, the organic results. And they're the results that have got there as a result of search engine optimization, which is a great big, huge, um, you know, I guess a, a way of explaining how search works and how you can get yourself into the better sides of those results. Now, if you're showing no results whatsoever, um, we're not saying that by doing some of these things, you're going to get up to number one today. 
things take time. Um, and I've got a few stories and examples I'll give you along the way of how we've been able to sort of get others in that. And, and sometimes it's something that doesn't happen for months. In some cases, it might take up to a year for that result to go. But when it does happen, by goodness, it really, really does happen. There's been a bit of an impact and a bit of a change when it comes to the voice. Now you notice some, probably all the young ones, uh, not really going and typing in Google search results to a computer these days. It's all on a mobile phone, but they're also not typing those results in on their thumbs on a mobile phone. They tend to talk their phones. They'll say, hey G or hey S word. I'm not gonna say them out loud. So it's gonna set up everyone's phones, but hey G and hey S, um, where's the closest Thai restaurant? and they'll get the results back usually by voice or at least on their screen. They've become very, very used to not just touching an interface, but talking to an interface as well. It's become a natural way for anyone under 25 to interact with their phones rather than always having to tap, tap, tap like the rest of us do with our big ungainly thumbs. They'll talk to their phone and the phone will give them results based on what they're doing. And if you've got a, a Google-based phone, an Android phone, that primarily is bringing back resu results from Google. But what you may not have known too, is that when you're asking a question to Siri through an Apple device, it's also using Google search results. Google actually pays to be the default search engine for Siri on Apple devices, such as Macs and iPads and iPhones as well. So the impact there has been that desktop search has absolutely plummeted. It's plummeted to like below, yeah, around about that 10 to 12.5% of all searches are happening there. But so many more of those searches now are happening on mobile and a big chunk is starting to happen on voice as well. You notice in these figures here that about 40% of the searches were still happening in desktop in 2018. This year that's dropped to around about, you know, 12 to 15% is happening on the desktop in environment. The searches now are by far and above happening mostly on mobile phones. It's up to just about that, just under that 50%. And of those, we're finding that about 20% are happening on voice. So it's been a very big turnaround in the way that people use search, which means it's a very big turnaround in how you will prepare your online presence for being found on Google. But of course it's complicated. It's not the easiest thing in the world. There's over 450 factors that are taken into account when it comes to where you're placed on the Google ladder. And that's from the head of search at Google himself, basically saying that if you're trying to trick the system and work it out and, and you know, use some you know, black hat kind of techniques to get yourself to the top of Google ahead of everybody else, just bear in mind there's over 450 of those little tweaks you're gonna have to get if you're gonna get there, but there's certain evergreen, ever present, ever true ways of getting yourself towards the top of those results that never fail to work. And it's the tricks and the little tips and the little hacks and the little, oh, I'll just do this little trick or just do this in your URL or just squeeze these words on your page. It's those little things that actually stop working over time. And they're the first things to fail. But these evergreen things we'll take a look at today other things that actually do work. Now I might have to jump in between this particular presentation and another one that I'll bring in. that has got a little bit more up-to-date information. I just delivered a little bit earlier this week. I just haven't merged the two documents together. But when I do, it'll be a little clunky. I'm sorry about that, but it will be really, really cool information I'll bring across. Now there's a whole bunch of different kinds of SEO. So if we think of SEO, it's not just one thing. It's not just about the page speed. It's not just about you know, the things you're writing on the page of a website. It's based on a whole bunch of different things. The on-page SEO I'll go into shortly, off-page SEO. Like I call this the Olympic rings of SEO. There was five major factors until recently when another one jumped in, which was voice. So I broke my Olympic rings and it turned into a lot messier kind of look. But what it does tell you is that SEO or working with Google is an ever shifting set of sands. It's an ever changing beast. It's never truly the same, but there's certain principles, particularly in the off page area, um, in the technical area and in the local area that don't really change all that much. So let's look at a bit of a breakdown of how these work on page SEO is all about how you've written your titles on your page. So the title of your website, the titles of your page, the subtitles as you're going down. If you ever noticed them, if you're using WordPress or something like that, that people use things like H1 and H2 and H3 as little tags that they put against those different size headings. That's why they do it because that's what Google is reading 
as trying to work out what the topic is and what the specialty is of that particular page and of that particular website. On-page SEO is also covered by your text content. So that's the actual written stuff in there. And there's been a lot of big changes with the how Google is saying to pick up that kind of text now. We used to squish in tons and tons of keywords. We wanted, if we were a, let's just say, a, uh, a Gold Coast plumbing service, and we wanted to be found for Gold Coast Plumber, then what we do is write Gold Coast Plumber in as many combinations as we possibly could, as many times as we possibly could on a web page in the hope that that would win. That doesn't win anymore. That used to be the case. It certainly is not now. You might still find some people who do still sit towards the top of the rankings in your particular town um, who have done that. And that's quite simply because they got lots and lots of traffic earlier in life and no one else has really done anything any better. And you find this particularly in smaller towns. We find it in Alice Springs. We find it in you know Emerald. We find it in Roma and Cloncurry and places like you know Kununurra and Broome, where there's not a lot of competition there. So the incumbent who always had the you know the most um, dodgy website crammed full of keywords tended to get the lead. But it's certainly not the case anymore. And, it, and there's things you can do you can easily knock those people off now. So that text content can be in the format of asking questions and giving answers. And there's a really great formula I'll give you soon about how you can write your content on your website that really piques Google's attention, not as a trick, but it actually just answers exactly the way that Google is trying to search for a site and to find the answers that the people are asking, particularly locally in your particular market. It can come down to the address structure. So when I say address structure, it'd be like, you know, my web, mywebsite.com forward slash blogs forward slash uh, the way to open tight jam jar lids. So writing what the actual topic is as what they call the slug code in WordPress and quite often it's called the, um, you know, whatever forms the address of, the, of that particular article or page within your website, that's what we're talking about. So if that particular, um, that particular address of a blog post or an article or a page on your site, apart from the homepage, it contains information about what the topic is that's being discussed in there. That's actually quite helpful for you. But squeezing in, you know, plumber, Darwin, plumber um, into your URL. So making it like www.plumberdarwinplumber.com is not going to get you more easily found as a plumber in Darwin, for instance. That's just not quite the way it works. Google's a little smarter than that these days. It knows when people are trying to cheat and it knows to work around that and actually reward. It doesn't so much penalize those who do the wrong thing these days. It's more about rewarding those who do the right thing. So it's less about being simply the most popular website in the planet and more about answering the questions that people have within the context of which they're asking them. And that's a really important differential to go and think of, Am I answering the kinds of questions that my potential target customers have on my web page in the context that they're asking for it? If they are women between 18 and 29, are you writing something that's, that's so well matched to what it is they're looking for in what you do rather than you just putting your marketing message out there? So Google understands the, the behavioral aspects of what we call intent and intent is what people go into Google to do. So they're starting off and going, I want to find out um, how to make my own scented candles. So Google's starting to get this whole thing with understanding that someone's got a behavioral aspect and what they're typing in matches that up and goes, okay, you're not looking to buy scented candles. You're looking to make scented candles. Okay, I understand the difference between the two. So I'm not going to throw you results or talk about buying scented candles from a local scented candle shop. I'm going to take you through the craft shop that sells all the tallows and all the different mixtures and the soy waxes and the fragrances and the little jars so you can make your own scented candles and do your own pouring. So it's a very, very different approach. That intent is a very big difference that's come up in Google, particularly in the last two years, where they truly understand the intent of what you're going in to get out of each search on Google, not just um, simply answering a question with what the most obvious one will be. That's why I can search for scented candles today and you can search for scented candles today at the exact same time, uh, miles and miles apart and get completely different, utterly different answers there. 
it will know that for instance, I've been looking at buying scented candles, but it may have known that over the last two weeks, you've showing behaviors that indicate that you're doing something else with scented candles. You're maybe wanting to become part of a network marketing crew that sells those scented candles. It will be able to tell that difference and deliver us a very different set of results on the Google index. Is that unfair? Well, probably not because we've got different intent. I'm looking for a very different answer than you are. So it's not really that fair that we both get the same result because we're not looking for the same thing, even though we type in exactly the same stuff at the same time on that search engine. Your internal links are where you're linking from something on your page to something on another page within your website. So you'll notice some if you ever read, say, the Courier Mail or the West Australian or the NT News or any of those newspaper websites, they'll often take you to related articles midway through. So you'll be midway through reading some political arc article, and then there's a link that takes you to another story that's related to that same topic in some way. Those internal links are showing that you're building relationships between one page and another page that are not necessarily easily found between each other any other way. So those links allow you to show that there's a theme that goes throughout your site. And that theme could be something like political news. So you link from one political article to another political article, which then links to another three itself. It's going, okay, I can now start to see a flow of working through a particular topic in that particular website. So I know how to deliver those responses and those questions and answers to people on Google based on I know how the flow goes through your website when somebody is going in again with that intent, that intent to find out more about that particular politician or that particular um, you know, version of massage. I know that I can go through this site and go on a journey through learning as much as I can about this particular kind or this modality of massage or of relaxation, which then sets you apart from people who just put a bunch of facts on one page. So again, it shows that you have to go into a little bit more thought when you're writing material for your website. Um, but it does show you that there is a way for you to start chipping away at the people that are a little bit higher than you on the search engine results just by doing these things that Google sets out for you to do. The same thing goes for external links when you're linking out to other things. So for instance, if you're a tour operator, for you to link out to something like your local tourism association or your regional tourism operate office or you know other um, other tourism experiences if you're a tour operator you might link to and you do walking tours you may link out to somebody who's got let's just say they've got a a, a bus tour or a an aquatic tour or they're a hotel or they're a cafe or a restaurant that they don't compete necessarily with you they're complementary businesses by linking to others it shows you're part of a community and again, it allows for Google to have related things. So if you're linking to this particular cafe and you're a walking tour, then if someone was looking for um, cafes where... Uh, sorry, my, um, my, I keep asking Google questions and it keeps answering them on my phone all the time. I ask, I say the right or wrong combination of words. The, um, if you're looking for something like, for instance, cafes that, are, cafes that will pass on my walk past darwin's parliament house then it's going okay well i'm probably going to look for ones that actually mention they're part of darwin's parliament house to do with walking i get this walking tour has a list of the cafes they walk past that's the result i'm going to hand back because that seems to match the intent of the person that's searching for that information right now so this is probably already starting to explode some heads at the moment you're going oh my goodness all i want to do is just know that when people are looking for me they find me yeah, that's true. That's exactly what you want to do. The fortunately, if you've got a strong enough brand for who you are and what you do, people will search directly for you. They'll type your brand into Google. And that's the best possible scenario because what that allows you to do, it allows you to go, well, they're looking for me directly. Therefore, I'm going to be able to be found easily because no one else has my name or no one else in my market has my name. So if they're looking for, you know, SEO Darwin and I'm the SEO guy in Darwin, then they should be able to find me really easily, right? But it falls down if there's 15 other SEO people in Darwin that I'm not going to be found so easily. I'll be found for my brand Clickstarter because it's very quite out there and quite well known in my markets. But if I'm not using that and I'm just getting relying upon people to find me based on what I do, then I'm at competition with everyone else in the marketplace. 
everyone else who's selling the same services as me, I'm up against them. So it's a battle for me to sort of claw my way up the top there with them also trying to claw their way up to the top then as well. It's a real, it's a real cage fight sometimes. And that's the reality of very competitive industries of how you're gonna to have to play that. But there are different parts of SEO. It's not just about your links, it's not just about the content that's on your website. It's also about the things that are off of your website, what we call off page. SEO. And that's to do with the links that are coming back to you. Buying thousands of links from a link farm in Bangladesh is not going to improve your SEO or your results on Google. Even if it improves it for a day or a week within a month, that will be completely taken away and you'll be marked as quite a dodgy operator. That's what we call black hat SEO. Black hat SEO is dodgy SEO pretty much. White hat SEO is the good things. Black hat SEO is the bad things. And what they call gray hat is often the SEO that you use when it's kind of a little bit black, a little bit gray. It's not illegal, it's not bad, it's just not particularly encouraged, but it works. So I tend to stick to the white hat stuff and occasionally do a little bit of gray stuff. But if anyone's ever asking me to do, if anyone's ever asking me to do uh, black hat SEO, I just refuse to do it because it reflects on me and I don't want to do that. So getting those backlinks is more about growing um, relationships with people. So where you're joining networking organizations. Now I know that one of the top results when looking for my particular brand Clickstarter is from Tourism Top End. Another one would be from Chamber of Commerce Northern Territory. Now these are reasons because they are considered to be quite what they call domain authority, the high domain authority. Those are known to be authoritative websites on their own. So a link from them is a powerful thing to have. Likewise, one of the companies I contract to, which is Treaty Bissell Consulting, runs a couple of government programs and is recently involved with a, um, a, a very big Northern Territory government program to deliver small business upskilling and small business uh, education. So therefore, they've got links back from these .gov.au websites. So it'd be like obm.nt.gov.au has a link back to our particular website. That's like getting a thousand other links. If you can get a government site to link back to you through some relationship you've got with them or through some program you're working on with them, it is a magical thing to have. It gives you so much more credibility, so much more authority, and it sticks you way above your competitors and it makes you just, you know, it just means that if you've got one or two links from government properties, it literally is like having a thousand other links from other dodgy sites. It's so much more powerful because of the authority and the credibility of the sites that are linking back to you. So getting thousands of links through really dodgy little um, you know, directory sites and all that has no real power. But having one or two, three, five, 20 links from high domain authority websites is gonna make it such a difference. And you're gonna see you shooting up those rankings. For Treaty in particular, we were able to take them from not even showing anywhere of any interest within the first 20 pages for things like grant writing and tender writing. Now they are number one in their market because we did the right thing. And we've got links coming back to us from government organizations. Now, it may be controversial, but there is such a thing as reputable directories. Now, whether you've dealt with these companies or not before, I'm talking about local search and census, the you know, home of the yellow pages and true local and all those things. Now, you may think, oh, no, I've had dealings with them. They're definitely not reputable. But Google looks at them a little bit differently. You need to be present in those directories because they are two of the most high authority style directories within Australia. We don't have the Better Business Bureau like America does. We don't have Little Brown Book, which is quite a high authority business directory as well. But we do have Yellow and we do have Local Search. And those particular directories, you can get free entries in. So you can get a free placement in either Local Search or Yellow. And that allows you to have a link back to your website from there. Now, even though that's not regarded as a follow link, now as a technical term for follow means that basically Google says, oh yes, I can follow that link and index it. As, but what it does tell Google is that, well, there is at least a link there. I recognize there's a link there. So therefore I can throw a little bit of the authority that yellow and local search have got and hand that over to you. As opposed to another directory, which might be, um, what's on in cloncurry.net.au, which has a whole bunch of links to a whole bunch of businesses that have nothing to do with cloncurry. 
but it's these little things someone put together as they thought it'd be a cool way to make some money. Um, we see local directories everywhere. It's like this kind of website that lots of people like to build for themselves in the hope they'll make lots of money and no one ever does because there's truly two guys that own the game, census and local search. You do not have to pay. Now, even if someone calls you and says, well, you, you won't be found and no one will be able to see you in the directory if you don't pay for this, it's like they're lying. You can have a free entry in there. That's why they encourage you to do it because it also helps them to update what they're doing. Then we've got citations. Citations are like where you are um, cited as the source of some kind of information. So if you are an expert, we'll go back to that particular massage therapy thing again. You're an expert in a particular modality of massage therapy and you write about that stuff and you get cited by others in your industry or others who work in complementary medicine elsewhere or even by medicine or doctors and they cite you in a study, they cite you in a paper, they cite you in a newspaper article or a magazine article or in some blog somewhere where they've cited you as being an expert in that particular thing, that adds more authority and credibility to you. So the more of those you can get, the better off you're gonna be as well. So I just clicked on the um, thing without really realizing that. And authoritative documents like um, PhDs, so um, theses from university, any sort of um, you know scientific studies, anything like that that's going to link to back to you is highly powerful as well. They don't have to necessarily just link back to your website. They can mention your brand. So if you've got a particular brand or your name, for instance, I'm very lucky, I guess, because I've got a very standout name. Um, there's not many of us in the world. In fact, there's only one guy else. I think he lives on the East Coast of the USA. it has got the same name as me. So if you're looking for me and my expertise, chances are you're gonna find it really quickly. If you've got a more common name, then you may have a brand. If that brand is mentioned as well as your name within that article, within that document, within that thesis, within that white paper, then you get the value of that. Google can read that, it can scan it. It says, ah, yes, that's another bit of authority. I'm gonna cast over that person who's doing that particular thing as well. Brain's exploding yet? That's a lot of information so far. I've only hit two of the six rings. Let's get to number three, which is the technical stuff. Pretty much what it's all about is making your website load as fast as you possibly can because we're mostly using them on these things, mobile phones, right? So people are not gonna wait for your stuff to load. Most of the SEO scanning tools, um, and I'm gonna look at a few of those later on, we'll talk about the five second mark. If your page takes more than five seconds to load, people just aren't gonna bother. They will waste another 15 seconds going back to Google to research again, to get to another result, to get to a better, faster page than waiting for you to load in six seconds. That is very, very optimistic. I'd say it's more like three seconds. If you don't load within three seconds, even two seconds on a phone, they'll just click away from you again if you're not delivering that stuff really super fast. So that means, how do you do that? How do you do a fast site? Well, part of that is you've got to optimize the media that's on your site. That is downsizing the site, the, the file size of the photos you're using. I know you've got amazing photography. I know you love your slideshows and I know you want to have this big video playing in the background of your website, but your potential clients don't care about that. They just care that they're getting to the information they need from you as soon as possible, which is often just getting to a website loads fast enough for them to click call now on it. You don't want to miss out on that person clicking call now because you've got this great big sweeping drone footage video in the background that nobody cares about. You will, you think that's all your brand. It's not, it's, it's actually doing you a lot of damage. So please stop using slideshows on websites. Please stop using massive photos that are like five megabytes to download. And please, for the love of everything good and hopeful in this world, stop using videos in the backgrounds of your websites. It's, it's not impressing anybody. It's really not. It's just, it's just something which you want to do because it looks pretty but it actually does you so much harm because you've got, I've got clients who I've had to convince to take down videos that are 52 megabytes in size. Every time someone goes to load that page for the first time, it takes forever to download because of a 52 megabyte video in the background. It's not worth it. Trust me, it's just, just not worth it. Using things like caching within your website, it's usually just something you just toggle and say, I wanna cache it. But you may wanna use things that go a little bit further into that, which is what we call content delivery networks. Now, WordPress has a built-in one if you're using the wordpress.com, which is the all-in-one WordPress. They do the hosting and all that for you. They will also do it through a plugin called Jetpack. 
Now, Jetpack is a free plugin from WordPress, Press, sorry, that takes some of the WordPress.com features and brings it into your own self-hosted version of WordPress. What it allows you to do is to plug into what they call WordPress's content delivery network. And a content delivery network basically is about taking a copy of your website and putting it in lots of places around the world. So they've got presences in places like Sydney, Melbourne, Auckland, Singapore, Jakarta. So if someone's searching for your products in Taiwan, they're going to get a version that's coming from Taipei, not from Sydney. So they get the fastest possible version there is. And because your web hosting probably costs you about, you know, between $5 and 20 bucks a month, their web hosting is far better and far faster than yours will ever be. So by mirroring that site across the Jetpack network, it makes it so much quicker. Quicker again is going through a thing called Cloudflare. Now, Cloudflare's own built-in content delivery network for free is pretty impressive. It's one of the fastest things you'll ever see. It speeds up your site. If you've got a site that's taking six seconds to load, there's a very good chance that Cloudflare can get that down to about three seconds. And that three seconds is making a massive, massive difference to how many people are going to stick around and actually follow what you're doing. So you definitely want to be able to do that if you can. Though... If you go with Jetpack as a free option, it will do that for you as well. Cloudflare has got some other options and for more complicated websites, I will often use it, particularly if they're, you know, I need to get them just half a second faster to get them ahead of their, their, um, their uh, competitors. I will spend the $20 US a month to get the full on uh, pro version of it just to get that extra half a second faster. So this can be a pay for play environment. There's a few things you can do, like making sure your photos are, you know, the file sizes aren't huge. You've gone through a process where you've preset those photos to make them a smaller file size without losing too much of their quality. Having a file, having a photo which is 3000 pixels wide is just gonna slow your site down. Get it under a thousand maximum if you can, if you absolutely have to have it, maybe 1900, but going to 3000, it's just utterly unnecessary. It's just going to slow people down. You may not think it's slow at your end because your computer has cached that photo locally. So it doesn't go to the internet to load that photo all the time. It's just loading it straight from your computer. So don't fall into that trap because most people who visit your site are visiting it for the very first time. And using something like optimized code, which can be done in WordPress, um, things like uh, Wix, if you're using Wix or Weebly or um, any of those sort of word, uh, those um, web hosting based kind of uh, providers like uh, GoDaddy and Crazy Domains, if you're using one of their web builders, they already do a lot of that code optimization for you. Their only problem is that their structure of their websites aren't built very well for the on-page side of SEO. But for the technical stuff, they're actually kind of good and they, they work the way they're probably meant to. Then we go to what we call local SEO. Now, local SEO is all about Google My Business. That's pretty much where it starts. And for a lot of us, that's where it's going to end as well. Getting that Google My Business profile for your business is the number one thing you should do before anything else on these lists. Number one, make sure that you're able to be found as a business name on Google My Business. And if you don't know what Google My Business is, just type in any business name you can think of and see the panel that comes up on the right, or it's the first result that comes up in mobile search results. It is so important to have that. That is your own control place on Google. That's the equivalent of you having a Facebook business page, but on Google. And you can do things just like you can do on Facebook as well. You can post to it. You can actually post events that will stay there and then become part of the local event structure of your local area on Google. When people type in what's, got, what's on in, what, what's on in um, Townsville this week, they'll be able to see what's on Townsville, including what you've put into your particular event postings in Facebook and on Google. That's all part of your profile. The more data points, the more information that you can put into your profile on Google, the easier it is for Google to go, I know what you do. I know exactly who you're looking for. And I'm going to deliver these people to you that were never able to find you before because you're providing me with enough information to work on that I can adequately deliver that information back to people through those search engine results. It's a very, very, very wide web of information you've got to provide, but it's so worthwhile doing some of this first basic stuff in Google My Business, that number one thing. Bing has their own version of this. So Bing, if you've not even heard of it, is the search engine by Microsoft. 
Uh, it also has a thing called Bing Places. You can set that up as well. And you can basically just um, log in as your Google account, and even drag across the information from your Google My Business thing. It's a great way to do it. And it means you're able to you know, replicate that in the second biggest search engine after Google. And the third one is Apple Maps. So if you're using an iPhone and you're ever using the GPS stuff on there, the, you know, the maps that searching directions through that, you're using Apple Maps. So wouldn't it be great if you came up in that? Not everyone does. They do scrape a lot of stuff out of Google. So a lot of those business names will come across, but it'd be great for you to be able to control what your particular pin on that map looks like and the information that Apple has about you. So you can set up your own Maps can, uh, Apple Maps Connect account and that will allow you to do that. So if you just want to do that, you want to jot that down and say, oh yeah, I definitely want to be on Apple Maps. Just type in my business on Apple Maps into Google, funnily enough, and it will give you the result of how you can set it up. It's a free thing to do. You don't have to pay for it, but it does allow you to control a little bit more of the information that is about you online on different platforms. That said, if you're going to be on Google My Business, Bing Places and Apple Maps and, and local search and yellow and all those places, it is vitally important that you have the same consistent information about your business in every location, right down to the fact that if you have a phone number for your business, 0412345678, and you put gaps between the first four numbers, the second three numbers, and then the end, then you've got to have those gaps in every instance of your phone number that you can find and control in every place where it is placed on the internet. Or if you just jam all your numbers together, make sure that jam together version of your phone number is consistent across all the places where you have that phone number. Same with email addresses. If you've got a particular email address for your support or your customer service, make sure that Google Maps has that, Bing has that, Apple has that, um, Yelp has that, TripAdvisor has that, the exact same email address, the exact same address, the exact same postcode, the exact same everything in every location as you possibly can. It may take you a little time to track that down, but when Google sees that it's consistent across all of them, that gives them another reason to go, this is a credible business. They've taken time to make sure that every single instance of what is about them is the same and it's up to date and it agrees with each other that says yes tick that's a good result to be throwing back as an example of a business that someone might be looking for in your particular industry and then things like check-ins are really quite valuable people checking in on things like foursquare uh checking in on google and doing those sort of like I, yeah i did go there and um, i'm going to rate it and rank it and all that and then check-ins on facebook check-ins on any sort of social platforms where you can check into a location they also help as well they send a signal back to all the platforms to say oh, okay someone's talking about this and this is where that intent thing comes up with google again if there's a particular new donut place in your town and everyone's talking about it but they're new it will be really really helpful for their results if people are checking in at their donut place and there's a lot of buzz going on, it tells Google, oh, I need to raise this up a little bit because there's a very good chance if someone's looking for a donut place in Kempsey in northern New South Wales, they're looking for that particular donut shop that's being talked about right now. So if there's a lot of buzz about something you're doing, where I am in Darwin, there's a lot of buzz about the moving of a, a gelato shop called John John's and John John's has moved and that created a lot of buzz. If you're looking for gelato in Darwin, you, Darwin you're going to find John John's every time because there's so much buzz about them. They've done no SEO. They've got not a great website at all, but what they've done is made sure they've got lots of buzz going on around them and lots of talk and lots of social media and lots of check-ins. And they've created that. So it makes it, it goes back to Google and says, when someone's looking for gelato in that town, they're probably looking for John John's. So that's your local stuff. Then we've got your reputational, which is very closely related to the local stuff. This is reviews and recommendations. Your Google reviews are the number one place to go. Even though people will find it much easier to do recommendations on Facebook or a not recommendation on Facebook, really what you want to do is encourage people to put it down in Google. Why? Because it's on Google's platform. Of course, it's going to listen to that one, number one. So if you can get people to review on Google, that is a really good start for you. The more reviews that happen on there and how reviews happen, and even with Facebook as well, the power of your review isn't necessarily in the content of that person's review. If that person gave you a bad review, you're still getting a point for being mentioned as you would as with a, with a good review. So it starts off, think of it like in terms of points, right? So I'm going to do it on my fingers over here. 
So on my left hand side or your right, I think, um, I've got one point for getting a bad review. I've got two points for getting a good review. That's great. Now I, I have a business and I've answered that bad review. I get another point. If I've got a business and I haven't done a, a response to that good review, I don't get an extra point. But if I do, I get a third point. If that person responds back in a conversation ensues on that bad review and it doesn't have any nastiness to it, you get another point. If that also happens over on here and you've answered back and they've answered back again, you get another point. So you can see how those points can grow. Even with a bad review, Google isn't looking at you as a bad business. They're looking at you as a business that actually took time to respond to the bad review and do something with it and have a constructive and civil conversation about it. And yes, they read those responses. They can see the intent. They can see the mood coming across in it. As I said in my last reputational thing and how to, um, to manage your reputation on Google uh, a little while ago, you don't win a war of arguments on reviews and recommendations. It only makes you look bad if you want to do that. Try and take those things offline if you can. But if you have to respond online, be courteous, be professional, and always offer to help someone out. It'll diffuse many a bad situation. Same with TripAdvisor or any booking sites like booking.com, hotels.com, Expedia, where they're constantly asking you to provide the experiences you've had, um, even on things like Airbnb and Uber. Um, ratings that go through those are also equally important. And of course, there's mentions on local sites, say for instance, news sites. Um, if you're being mentioned the West Australian or the um, the west.com.au or any of those, or let it be the local paper in Cairns or the local paper in Brisbane or the Gold Coast or Sunshine Coast, those kind of mentions actually do carry through as part of your reputation as well. And then finally, the voice one is creating things that are in snippets. Now, a snippet for Google is basically asking and answering a question. So for example, that question may be, how do I make scones? So what you want to do is make sure that the information about how to make scones is delivered in a very precise and concise and, and very clear format. It's usually in the format of the way to make scones is just like my grandmother used to take me to teach me. And it does take time and a little bit of technique. Let's get underway. Step one, blah, step two, blah, step three, blah. Going into a very logical sequence like that creates what is called structured data. And structured data is massively important to Google because that's how people are asking the big G how to do things these days. If they're asking a question of where are the best coffee places in Mackay, you would, you, you would go so far if you had a local site in Mackay to have a page that just says that and says, um, the great, we've rated, we've rated the best coffee places in Mackay based upon our own taste, upon their consistency and upon the popularity of their venues. The first one is number one, it is coffee cup espresso in Jones street. Number two is Gloria jeans in Smith street. And you go on down a list. So you answer it very, very quickly. You answer that question. Then you go into dot points that back you up that creates the question and answer side of Google. And that can be a massively important way of getting results into voice queries in Google. Just about everything that people ask about in, in Google are things that don't lead to a click through to a website. So this is where your brand will come. So if you, if someone's asking, Hey G, what's the best place to go and buy swimwear in Gladstone? then you want to make sure that if you're selling swimwear in Gladstone, you're somewhere in there. So you're creating some kind of presence on your site that lists you as a place to go to, or you make sure that the places that are getting a lot of that, that you're on their lists. Conversational English is a massive point when it comes to voice as well, because we don't talk formally and we don't talk high pitched or in some sort of like, we don't look down our nose at Google as we're starting to talk to people. Conversational English, everyday English, that's the way that people are going to be talking these things. They go, hey, G, where's the best Italian place in town? And so you need to answer it like, the best Italian place in town is blah. And you explain why you're the best Italian restaurant in town. The whole ask a question, answer a question thing works for SEO as uh, like on, on page SEO and for people to go to your actual website to see a result, as well as working in voice. 
it's become incredibly more important for that on-page results for people finding information to get to your site by asking questions and answering them. And I have got a formula that is such a winner and I've made it work on so many websites in this last two years, it's incredible. Think about everything you write on your website as a chance to answer a question that someone's asking, but you're doing it preemptively. You're getting ahead of them and going, I know exactly what my customers ask. So the first formula is when you build pages around your website or a blog post around your website, the first 10 things you should write about are the top 10 things that people ask you about your products or your services. That forms the basis of all the things that people are gonna ask about you. The top 10 things are gonna attract those searches like crazy because people are going straight into Google and typing those questions in or speaking those questions to their phones. So if you're answering those, you're already ahead of everybody who's not. And then the second thing to do is ask and answer the 10 questions that you wish people would ask you about your business or your processes or your services or your products. So you've got 20 pages of content right there, 20 blog posts, 20 articles that will help you be pinging Google all over the place going, I'm answering all these questions that people in my area are asking. This goes for anyone if they're even selling stuff online, it's like services and coaching or even products that they're selling on an e-commerce site to a wider audience than just their local town. By doing this, you're getting ahead of those who don't do this. And if you're the first in to do it in your town, you've got a natural advantage because by the time they do it, you've already been getting all the traffic, which is part of the hassle in Google is that everyone who's done all the right stuff five years ago are way ahead of where you are. So you can catch up to that by doing the right things too, being ahead of everyone else. And if you can do those extra things that the incumbent people who did all the right things five years ago have not been doing in the last couple of years, like this structured data thing, then you're gonna scoot straight past them as long as you're doing it consistently and you continue to do it. So I'd say the structure would be, and this is my tip, if you wanna write this one down, I don't have it actually on a slide here, but it'd be to every article on your website is a question. How do I? Where is? What is? Who is? So think of the questions, when, where, what, who, how, and why. And base those questions around those top 10 things that you wish people would ask or the top 10 things that people do ask. And then you immediately answer that question in the first paragraph. You make that answer so clear. Then you go down and in dot points, you list your reasons why. Um, the best coffee in Gladstone is at the Raw Drip Coffee House. And there is why. Number one, they use this particular kind of beans. Number two, they put it through cold brew so that it has an extra sweetness to the coffee without having to add any sugar. Number three, because it does this overnight so you know it's actually getting the flavors fully developed rather than just being pressed out and hot out, out of an espresso machine. You can go down those and by providing those answers, you're answering the questions ahead that people are already asking in their heads when they're going to Google. So you can answer them and no one else in town is, you've got the natural advantage. Also, um, I don't know why I got booking sites and mentions on local sites. They're not actually meant to be there on this screen. So ignore those last two, but that answering questions, things, creating structured data within your site that Google can quickly scan and find out in dot points and numbered dot points about what it is you do and why it is that people should find you for that thing. Then that's going to take you so far ahead of everybody else. And it's one of those things that no matter how many times I do these particular webinars and these particular workshops and work with clients, people still don't do it. It's this one thing because it just seems insurmountable. Oh my God, I got to go and write all these things on my website. Ugh. But the investment of time it takes to do this one thing, as well as setting up your Google My Business profile, far outweighs you know, the, 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 the value that you're going to get in the end. The, end. the end goal in a couple of months time of you doing these couple of things, restructuring what your writing is on your website, and doing your Google My Business profile and getting everything nice and up to date and in line with everywhere else, those two things alone will make such a massive difference to your results on Google. And it won't happen overnight. So I Pantene, it won't happen overnight, but it will happen. You will get a better result. And the example I will give for you will be, let me go, I worked with a group called Bino Drilling. They drill boreholes on rural properties so they can access the artesian water below. 
So bino drilling could, just couldn't even be found on Google to start with. And there was always another guy that was always at the very top and then another one that was second. And the third result was a company that didn't even exist anymore. They were coming lower than a guy that didn't even have a business anymore. It was like kind of ridiculous. So what we did, we structured everything that they had on their website to say, what are the questions that people are asking about you? What are the words, what are the keywords, what are the phrases that would attract those search results from Google? We went and replaced all the text on his website, a very small website, did a few structural things to make it work. And it didn't happen overnight, but it did happen within a month. Within a month, he went to the number one result. And now it's between him and that original number one, depending on the month of it, where it is or who's getting the most traffic, they go between one and two, one and two to see who wins. He went from basically thinking his business was going to go out of business three years ago. to now he has to subcontract out to his competitors, the extra work because he can't get to all the work. So it's one of those things where, yes, it won't happen overnight. You probably feel like you've wasted all this time, but you wake up six months later and you realize I'm getting all these results all the time. People are finding on Google. How'd that happen? Oh, that's right. I did that thing six months ago. That's what it led to. So it's worth doing my friends, absolutely worth doing. So what can you as a small business with your own website do right now? Well, there's certain parts of SEO that are, are much easier for you to do. I'd say claim that Google My Business profile as your number one thing if you have not got one now. Go and get it business.google.com. If you don't have one, get it. You can complete all those details, add in photos of your business, add videos if you've got them. Then uh, if people are asking questions about your business, monitor to that through the Google My Business app that's on your phone and you'll be able to actually answer those questions as people are coming up with it's great and also answering those reviews we know that's really important to do the more you do that the more that Google's going to see your responsive business and they will go well I'll throw you more traffic install Google Analytics on your website that allows Google to go a little bit deeper into understanding the structure and the usage and behavior of people who visit your website. You wanna be on there. It's not opening up the website to anybody to abuse. It's just giving Google more information about how people use your website, but also gives you information about how people use your website. Do they come in through the front page or they're coming through another page? With most of my websites, the majority of traffic comes in through what we call landing pages, not through the home page at all. So it's always interesting to see what those landing pages are and what the search trends of a particular week or month are. So I can go, well, I better do a bit more work in that area because lots of people seem to be responding it to it this month. A thing called Google Search Console, it's another bit of code you install on your website if you've got access to be able to do that. You submit your so this is how you submit your site to Google and then it monitors any issues that are coming up that may affect your search ranking on Google and it'll give you that response. This is a really, really good way to do it, to make sure that you have the option to be able to you know, have some control over um, knowing whether things are good or bad for your search ranking on Google. And they'll give you recommendations along the way of how to improve your ranking as well. So actually telling you how to better use their tools to get a better result out of them as well. Uh, Peter just asked a question. If you reach one, two or three in the rank for your organic search, would you still use Google's AdWords, which is the paid version of it? Well, that's going to be completely up to you, Peter. It depends. If you've got lots and lots and lots and lots of competitors and those, um, if you're at number three, um, you may consider wanting to get that, that Google AdWords result to get you to the top. But if you're already in number one, you're already getting the lion's share of those search results and clicks anyway. So you may not then necessarily need to get it. But what you would might do is rather than getting that search result against just a general broad match thing like, um, oh, I'm just going to say, let's just say if you're a, um, a personal trainer. So if you're going to be a personal trainer in Upper Swan, um, if you're looking for Upper Swan personal trainer and you come up for that as number one, um, then you go, well, I will do some ads, but not for that particular search term. I'll do it for something else, such as the name of your competitor. You can actually do that in Google. If you're, if you want to have your result in the ads come up when people search for your competitor's name, their very business, you can actually do that. That might be a way that you do it. You advertise against their keyword rather than advertising against necessarily um, the broad match stuff. So you do it more strategically where you go, when people are looking for my competitor, they will find you. And that's what you want to do. Now, the offset of that is that someone can do that to you too. So if, if your competitors get really nasty and pissed off about that, they may do the same thing to you. So just be aware that um, when you do things like that, there are some consequences to it, not from Google, but from the behavior of other human beings. 
You can run SEO health scans through a lot of these tools, Moz, um, Ahrefs is probably, uh, probably a bit more complex though. SEO site check. Dot com seo sitecheck.com is probably the one i use the most because it gives you a great report about the things that need to be addressed on any one website and you'll see it'll go through the technical things the on-page things the page speed things whether you're using a content delivery network it gives you all those things so se ranking woo rank sem rush are all pretty good at it but the one i use because it's probably a little cheaper and it's got a free initial scan that you can do and even compare yourself to your biggest competitor is SEO site check. Please use that one. It's a really good one because it, it does allow you to do a quick comparison to your, your website versus your competitor's website. And it will show you what they've done good and bad and what you've done good and bad and what you can do to get ahead of them if you're not already ahead of them. Now, bear in mind though, it's not gonna necessarily give you the idea that they are always gonna be ahead of you or you're always gonna be ahead of them. What I would do is do that comparison between you and your biggest competitor, the one that does sit at the top. And I'll show you the shortfall between you and they. And then you can update a whole lot of extra stuff and you'll be able to get that result through there. The things you can do yourself are probably that on-page stuff. So we're talking about like rewriting your content to fit in that sort of structured data stuff. The local stuff, such as um, you know, the Google My Business, Bing Places, Apple Maps are all things you can do yourself. Making sure you're on yellow and local search. And if you're on yellow and so lo local search already, but the information is old and it's an old address, harassing yellow and local search until they change that because they do have a, an obligation to make sure the information in their directory is also correct and up to date. The reputational stuff, you've got some control over that. You can ask people to review you. Yes, they probably won't. No, 90% of people never will send a review because they're just lazy and because it's not important to them to review. It's important to you as a business owner, but if you don't ask, you'll never get. So the idea is to drive some more reviews there just by asking people to send a review for you. And the voice stuff you can do by again, that structured data, those little snippets of information in, you know, ask a question, answer the question, use dot points to expand out a bit more information and make it a really easy way for places like Google and Bing to actually pick up all your information and know exactly what you do and match what you do to the intent of the person who's going in there to search for you. What you might need a hand with is some of the off-page stuff. There's quite often what a lot of people go out there and say, I need more links coming back to my site, get me more links. Um, that's becoming less and less important, the backlinks thing. It's actually used to be the number one thing and then people started cheating. So they made it about number three or number four thing now. What you'll probably need a hand with the most is the technical stuff. So setting up things like Cloudflare or content delivery networks in your website, um, optimizing everything to make sure those, those images are much smaller and much easier to play, running content delivery networks and minifying code. If anything, any of this stuff is making you scared, that's probably the stuff you need a hand with. So you can get a, get a hand with that through things like the Asbest Digital Solutions Program. So um, I'm available through that um, Although my name is not on the list, you can get hold of me through the, I think it's the ASBAS NT team or ASBAS Treaty NT team. You can look me up and actually um, get me through there. Um, otherwise, um, if you get stuck with that, just drop me an email, I'll put my email address in here and I'll give you the instructions on how to actually book me in to do a bit of a session. We can do a little bit of an overview um, under the ASBAS program. Um, I think it's still the $44 for an initial one. So if you've never done any one-to-ones on ASBAS before, it's $44. So if you have done some one-to-ones before, you can get it for 66 bucks for an hour. So in the bigger picture, for the result you're gonna get out of it, that's nothing. Um, if you're a really, really tiny micro business, I get that that may seem like a fair bit of money, uh, but then everything that's worthwhile does cost money in this world, doesn't it? Except love, even that, that's expensive. Last data went on, cost me 300 bucks. Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. I really appreciate your time and taking some time out to work on your business in this particularly dry topic. SEO is one of those things where you go, oh, I don't know quite what I'm going to do there. I don't know how I'm going to do it. But you can get in touch with me through Dante at clickstarter.com.au. You can get hold through that phone number as well. Um, we do also do um, full um you know, information about uh, SEO and do SEO packages and all that sort of thing too. But what I really think is a good idea for you to do, run a few of those free scans through those tools, go and look at some stuff that you can do yourself first. And if you get stuck, 
do an Asbest Digital Solutions program thing, get in touch with me and I'll help you to book that through. And we can help work through some of those issues so you can do most of it yourself, but just get a little bit of help when you need it. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon and I'll see you at the next webinar we're doing. I think I'm doing another one tomorrow. Wow, never, it never ends.